back with a top of the line, of the line. video on how to go about fixing a stone cold single pipe steam radiator. About 1200 years and 30 lifetimes ago now, my girlfriend and I remodeled an attic and turned it into a condominium that you might say was my very first foray into DIY. During that project, we encountered a lot of non-functional steam radiators, each one with a unique set of problems. Chances are, your radiator has one of those problems, so let's party like it's 1872. Let's start with a primer on single pipe steam radiator systems. Somewhere in a basement or crawl space, you have a boiler, which is turning water into steam. When water gets turned into a gaseous state, or steam, it wants to expand, which is a very handy property that brings heat through a series of pipes to your radiators. The steam will enter your radiator through the radiator valve, displace the air inside the radiator, and one hissy boy here at the end of the radiator will hiss with escaping air until hot steam reaches said hissy vent and closes the heat activated valve. Simultaneously, as the steam condensates due to meeting a cold radiator, it will precipitate back as water and drain back the way it came from, making way for more steam to enter the radiator until it is hot, so you'll hear the vent hissing throughout the boiler's heating cycle. Once the boiler is off, all the steam condensates into water and drains back into the boiler. Nice. But if you're here, something's amiss in your steamy machine, so let's have a look at every issue I personally encountered and how I solved it. Starting with patient number one, yeah, you guessed it, no heat. I could hear a gurgle and moving of water when the boiler started, but no heat. I felt around to see where the heat ended to no avail. Since we were in construction mode, it was feasible for me to start removing the subfloor to keep doing my tracing. I wound up finding this absolute circus, a reverse U-trap paired with this piece de resistance, a floor joist hacked to pieces like it was delinquent on a loan. If you want your radiator to work once and only once, then I suppose this is how you'd go about installing the plumbing. Because what happens is that steam will enter through this joint a few times, but then remain trapped here when it tries to return as water. After cutting through this mess with an angle grinder, this is how much water came out of the pipe. We wound up having to get another cast iron pipe cut and threaded at Lowe's that was short enough to accommodate a pitch to allow for proper draining and no more U-trap. Not to mention buttressing the weakened floor joist so no one winds up greeting the lower floors. So lesson one, no traps. I also had to significantly modify the valve setup here, including changing out the spud in the radiator, using the aptly named spud wrench to get it out, as well as the radiator valve itself. Next up, same patient, different problem. Radiators require proper pitch. Because if you leave it flat, water can't drain out, and in the worst case scenario, steam will have a difficult time entering the radiator, and you might even hear pipes banging as steam aggressively greets cold water, condenses creating a vacuum, and water gets fired like a missile into that vacuum. As a rule of thumb, you only need to raise the radiator on the end opposite the supply valve by one tenth of an inch for every foot. In other words, if the radiator is four feet long, raise one end of it by four tenths or two fifths of an inch like you see here. These things are very heavy, so you may want to consider using a scissor jack with some wood on top of it to distribute the pressure so you don't inadvertently crack the cast iron. To summarize lesson two, allow your radiator to drain water unless you enjoy a steampunk rendition of the 1812 Overture. Moving to the bedroom radiator, this one gave me two interesting problems. Once again, there was no heat whatsoever. Upon tracing the pipe into the wall and into a crawl space, I discovered that the cast iron pipe had actually split in half lengthwise. I suspect this was for two reasons. For one, improper pitch allowed water to pool, and two, because this was uninsulated in a crawl space, the trapped water froze and split the pipe. So I replaced that section of pipe and wrapped it in fiberglass. This gave the radiator some heat, but not enough, and this is where the wonders of balancing the radiator system comes in, using appropriately sized steam vents. The steam radiator system behaves much like a circuit, and like electricity, steam tries to find the path of least resistance which means that steam favors radiators which allow air to escape the easiest and also the radiators closest to the boiler. This poses a problem, especially for radiators very far from the boiler, such as radiators located on upper floors. The easiest way to remedy this if you have a particularly cold room is to increase the size of the air vent on your radiator, which will offer less impedance for the steam to push the air out. Using the Gorton brand of steam valves as reference, installing either the C size or D size in a cold room that's far away just may be the ticket to getting the radiator to heat up. 
You can find them on Amazon, and I'll leave a few links below, including their website so you can have a closer look at their equalizing explanation. So lesson three, try attaching an appropriately sized vent to your radiator. And man, that was a lot of technical details. So let's take a brief intermission here with easy lesson number four. Make sure that your radiator valve is open all the way by turning it counterclockwise. If it's defective and rusted shut though, you might have to replace it. If you do, you will need a pipe wrench, pipe dope on the threads, and an appropriately sized radiator valve. Do this job only when the boiler is shut off, and preferably not in the dead of winter. The next few issues I did not encounter per se, but it's good to have a general awareness of them. The system needs to be able to purge the air closest to the boiler, because if it doesn't, the system will not be very efficient because the steam won't be able to squeeze past the air trapped in the pipes and might not reach certain radiators. To accomplish this, somewhere near the boiler you should have an air eliminator like this one. Make sure that it's functional. You should be able to hear or feel air escaping from it during a boiler heating cycle. If it doesn't, it may be corroded or gunked up. Either clean it out or replace it altogether. The last issue to consider is an improperly dialed in pressure troll. The pressure troll is a device on your boiler which cycles the boiler on and off based on the pressure it detects inside the system. In essence, when your thermostat calls for heat, the boiler checks with the pressure troll first, and if the pressure in the system is below the set point, it'll turn on. Once the pressure exceeds the pressure troll's set point, it'll turn the boiler off, even if the thermostat is still calling for heat. This is done so that the system doesn't overpressurize itself during a heating cycle. Now the problem, as far as I know, can lie in the fact that steam heat is a long lost art form, therefore it's not uncommon for the plumbers installing the pressure troll on your boiler to set the pressure too high. This is unnecessary. As I said before, steam is a gas, so it's more than happy to expand into whatever space you have to offer to it. For most residences, there's actually no need to overly pressurize the system. Because if you do, your boiler will run a cycle for longer than it needs to, burning a lot more fuel than necessary for the exact same heating result. You really only need to give the steam some time to do its expansion thing and reach your radiators. Dan Hollihan, one of the last remaining wizards of steam knowledge and founder of HeatingHelp.com, will tell you that most single pipe residences need to only operate between a minimum cut-in of 0.5 psi and 1.5 psi to work properly. This is something that can be dialed in on your pressure troll. Main is your cutout pressure or the max pressure when your boiler shuts off. Set that to 1.5 psi using this screw spun counterclockwise. Differential is subtractive. Using this screw, set it to 1 psi. You subtract that 1 psi from your main set point, so 1.5 minus 1 equals 0.5 psi. This is now your cut-in pressure or the minimum pressure which turns the boiler on. Now your boiler will operate between 0.5 and 1.5 psi. This probably won't help with getting heat to your radiators, but in the grand scheme of things, this can help you save some money on the heating bill, and you can then use said savings on buying air vents and balancing your system. In summary, here's your list of hot tips hot to fix tips. your cold radiator, ordered by simplicity. 1. Make sure your radiator valve is all the way open. 2. Ensure your radiator is pitched to allow for the proper drainage of water. 3. Have an appropriately sized steam vent installed on your radiator. 4. Do not have any traps in your plumbing. 5. Check for any leaks from your plumbing, including the joints. 6. Inspect the air vent near your boiler for proper function, and clean it or replace it if you have to. 7. Lastly, you can fund this whole venture by saving some money with a properly set pressure troll. And there it is! I've done it! My head feels emptier, and hopefully I've enabled somebody to become cozier. Until next time, thank you for watching.